So now to our story for today, which is cracking the Democratic National Committee. Uh, I was a DNC member uh, and no one explained to me uh, specifically what that meant. Uh, and if I had been a, a, a little more with it, I would have realized that I could have looked up the bylaws and understood more about the structure. Um, I basically was called into a conference room with the chair of the DPO and he said, what do you, so why did you run for this and what did you want to do? And I said, well, you know, wherever I could contribute to the organization, uh, I have a lot of experience in local elections and, and uh, I, would, I would be glad to share them with the organization. And he said, uh, well, you know, there's really not going to be a lot of opportunity for you to give input, um, uh, but, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, and he was basically right. Uh, I went to the quarterly meetings of the Democratic National Committee, and they were a couple of days long, and there were uh, lots of dog and pony shows where different groups would, would recombine and meet, and we would get presentations from various uh, elected officials. Um, there was always a meeting, but the meeting agenda was always set, and no one ever changed anything. We had the, you know, the gazillion officers of the DNC sitting on the stage in front of us, and everyone just kind of sat there. I actually do not remember a vote being taken in the three years that I served. I was elected in the, in the second year of a four-year term to replace someone, and apparently all the action happened at the first meeting when they elected Debbie Wasserman Schultz as chair of the DNC. But it turns out that uh, uh, there, there is a lot of leverage and it, you know, it is a democratically run organization. And so what we need to do is understand where the, 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 the power points are in the organization so we can influence what goes on. Let's go to the first slide. Um, so the, the where to start is to look at the documents that govern the DNC. Uh, we are a country that is based on the rule of law. And so even though we don't always find people that, that uh, follow the rules, that's our assumption that is that everyone follows the rules. Otherwise, we end up just pulling out our guns and settling things in a gunfight. Uh, always better to do it with rules. The, the, the governing document is the DNC charter. And that is, that is the document that, that says that this comes into existence. And it's, it's kind of unusual because there is no recognition of political parties really in, in the federal government. Uh, the founding fathers hated political parties. And the last thing they wanted to see was political parties develop. But, you know, human nature being what it is, the first thing we did was divide up into two camps and we've been fighting ever since. So the top document is the charter. Underneath that, we have the DNC bylaws. Uh, you can kind of tell that these date back to 1848. Um, they're not the cleanest set of documents to read through, but they are unusually brief. Uh, you know, we, we have county parties here in Oregon with bylaws that are 29 pages long. Their bylaws is, you know, like, like on the order of, of six pages. And then governing the DNC, uh, Govern, being governed by the DNC bylaws are the state bylaws. So the DNC, <coughs> excuse me, charter state organizations. Um, so there is only one in each state and then they roll up into the, 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 uh, the greater organization. Um, the other governing documents that uh, we're gonna look at later, not so much today, but in a, in a future uh, show are the selection rules for delegates who will be going to the convention uh, so there is a, a document that is issued by the DNC, which are the guidelines for the delegate selection process. And then each of the states put together their own plan, which has them to be approved by the rules committee of the DNC. And if there's some deficiencies, they're flagged and then uh, the states correct them until uh, they both parties come into agreement. Um, uh, I called up the DNC and wanted to talk to someone about the rules and uh, she referred to the, the DNC delegation selection rules uh, where my answer was, but she wouldn't send me a copy of it, which I thought was weird. Uh, she wanted me to get it from my state party, which hadn't distributed them to the rules committee upon which I sit. <laughs> and, uh, but fortunately, through the miracle of the internet, uh, I mentioned this and within 10 minutes, someone on our team had found them and sent them to me. So I have posted them on the Advancement of Democracy website if you want to read through them. Uh, 
The next slide. Uh, so this was my per my first uh, discovery when I was reading this document. The the dominant organization in the Democratic Party is the Democratic National Convention. And what is and I hadn't expected to find this because this is a meeting that convenes only once every four years. Um, but what they do then is delegate the uh, the the operation of the party to the Democratic National Committee, which meets quarterly and allegedly conducts business. Um, and the Democratic National Committee then hires the executive director and the staff of the Democratic National Committee, who then really, really does the day to day operation. Um, and then they, <coughs> as I said earlier, the state Democratic parties roll up into that. Um, so remember this fact that the Democratic National Convention is the 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 place where uh, 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 the, the the central organization for this structure called the Democratic Party. Um, I want to show you a clip from it's just a short clip from the last convention, just to give you a flavor of what this once every four years meeting would be like. Uh, and there's like 2,700 people in the room voting. So, John, could we show that that clip? Awesome. Through the miracle of the internet, you can just whip it up. Uh, so this is actually a shot of the rules committee portion of the convention, which is at the beginning. And that is the uh, probably the rules chair speaking, a uh, little tiny dot in the center. And then those are the delegates, the, the, the 2,700 delegates or however many were in the convention at that point in time. Um, uh, listening to it. This was actually the point where they announced the unity commission that the rules committee had, uh, had voted on, on the previous Saturday. And so this was having the unity commission, uh, accepted by the convention itself. pervaded the, uh, the convention, uh, and that was a meeting. So 2,700 people yelling and screaming um, during the Rules Committee meeting. So keep that in mind when we talk about things, the things that we can do for next steps. Um, Betsy, is there any questions from the line yet? Uh, hearing none. So we'll, the next thing I want to do is talk about the, the key points that I found within the Democratic National Committee Charter, which is the overarching governing document of the Democratic Party. Um, so this is really interesting because it, it's kind of a, a, a brain twister. Like, what do you mean by the National Convention? Because it's actually a process that spread over a number of months, starting with the primaries in each of the states. Um, and so is that covered by the National Convention? Because that is really how the delegates that are selected are sent to the convention who then get chosen, uh, regardless of whether there's one or three, chosen to be the candidates of the Democratic Party in the November election. So Article 2, Section 4 says, allow participation in good faith by all voters who are Democrats and to the extent determined by a state party to be in the interests of the Democratic Party in that state by voters who are not registered or affiliated with any party. So this is really interesting. Um, so go to the next slide. Um, so we've been told that um, the, uh, we, we've been told that it is the Democratic National Committee that's, that, that states that we cannot open our primaries in presidential years, um, and uh, and like the sheeple that we are, we we took that on on good faith of our from our leadership, uh, and to the best of my knowledge, no one ever asked where the source of that that uh, that rule was, and so I was expecting to see something like that language in either the charter or the bylaws, and I didn't find either of those saying that the primary is closed. But I found this reference in the governing document. So this is in the charter. So uh, it 
it, it, it seems to be open to interpretation. Um, and there's a couple of other references that we'll talk about. But this says that if a if a party wants to open the primary to non-affiliated voters, we can do so. Um, and so we'll be having some conversations with our new leadership about where this rule comes from, because there are, of course, people interested in having an open primary in 2020. Um, the next slide is about the DNC membership. So this is this is the group of people who gets to conduct the business of the party in between the conventions. So the DNC membership itself is the chairperson and a second officer from each state. So there's 50, there's uh, you know 100 members. Uh, and in Oregon, it's the first vice chair uh, along with the chairperson. Then there's 200 members that are apportioned to the states. Uh, Oregon has three DNC members along with the chair and the, and the first vice chair. Uh, other states have many, many more like California has a, a really big uh, group of people. Then there's two members from Guam, the Virgin Islands, American Samoa and the Northern Mariana Islands. <coughs> and then there's around 17 democratic associations they get to send anywhere between two to three members. And this is like the association of governor, democratic governors, association of democratic secretaries of state. Um, there's a, a bunch of democratic organizations which are being recognized by the democratic party uh, as being eligible to send delegates to the quarterly meetings. So the, this, this is roughly about 300 people that get together every quarter to conduct the business of the party. The DNC executive committee uh, then is the group that allegedly meets and carries on the business uh, in between the meetings of the, of the, um, uh, the DNC itself, but they're only required to meet four times. I, I suspect that they meet more. Um, they are elected by the members of the DNC so even though uh, uh, they sometimes only have one candidate, which is what I expect, I suspect happened six years ago when Debbie Wasserman Schultz was elected. Um, uh, if you remember earlier, um, uh, there was actually a number of people who were running for the chair of the DNC, including uh, Keith Ellison um, and um, uh, Perez was the ultimate winner of that. So he is the director. He is the a chairperson of the DNC. Um, and then the last line I thought was interesting, shall keep a record of those proceedings which shall be made available to the public, not just Democrats, but to everyone in the country. Um, so the, the, the Democratic Party is, is allegedly transparent. The next slide is on the role of the chairperson. And I do remember people finding this and going, Debbie Wasserman Schultz isn't doing this. So it states in Article 5, Section 4, that the chairperson shall exercise impartiality and even-handedness as between the presidential candidates and the campaigns. The chairperson shall be responsible for ensuring that the national officers and staff of the DNC maintain impartiality and even-handedness during the Democratic Party presidential nominating process. Didn't happen uh, in 2016, but I, I hopefully they've learned their lesson and uh, and adhere to this um, this uh, mandate going forward. You think it'll happen, John? No, I'm going to jump in because I, I don't know where where Betsy is. We got a question here from Oz, uh, and it's basically asking that. Um, here, let me uh, let me pull it up here. And this is from Oz. And he says, uh, since the DNC won't follow their own charter, uh, as they did in 2016, what makes this them different from a dictatorship? Their own lawyers said they do not have to exercise the will of the base. They don't have to follow these. They're a private entity. They don't have to follow these bylaws, right? So why do we... <laughs> I mean... Yeah, and following that logic, why do even... If you aren't going to follow the bylaws, why have the bylaws? Right, well, um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a responsibility of the membership to make sure they adhere to it. I went to the the association of of democratic chairs and vice chairs and you <coughs> uh before the convention and you could just tell that uh that bernie sanders was barely tolerated with that group and they were to a person for uh hillary um 
and you know it starts with you would expect the chairs and the vice chairs to be foremost in ensuring that the bylaws are followed uh, but it's also to every dnc member to be complaining to their leadership when they don't do this um i you know because of the wikileaks dump of emails we didn't understand the full extent of their their diddling in the election until just before the convention if you remember those were dumped by um wikileaks just prior uh, but uh you know we should have been horrified when that happened uh, but you know how many people read through the the bylaws and even knew that this 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 these these existed i would suspect that very few people spend time reading through these uh, there are there any other questions yeah there's a question from molly solomon yeah there's a question from molly solomon and what's the impetus to do the right thing uh, well, as in any elected office, they get voted out um, or they get recalled guillotines. Uh, <laughs> or, or John's solution, which is guillotines. But, you know, if, if there's like if we don't like how the chair of the Democratic Party is behaving, we have the option to to recall that person. And it's the, the will of the state central committee. If the majority want that wants the officer out, they can recall them. Um, uh, it you know with a, a meeting that only occurs quarterly there's probably a trigger for having them more frequently but you know the it's such a cumbersome or organization it's probably very difficult to invoke but you know that is the recourse is they get voted out of office uh and it's the responsibility of the electorate not to be sheeple and sit there and put up with this but to be responsible i mean we are electing the dnc members to be delegates in our place carrying out the uh, their duties, of which one is to ensure that the leadership is following the bylaws. It's the glue that holds us together. Uh, Charlotte Brandt asks, do you have faith in Perez to adhere to the bylaws? Yes. Really? Now, really? yes. And uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, as we get closer to the election and people see that what could happen if things are not controlled and done according to the rules that uh, that the Democratic Convention will be the uh, the newsworthy event that it seems to have been for <laughs> most of the time in the last century. Uh, the Republican conventions are are, you know, never nothing ever happens in them except they nominate their uh, their their candidate. We have demonstrations. The Democrats, you know, look what happened in 68. Um, uh, uh, I, I think that they will understand that this, these things need to be managed and that they need to follow the rules. And if they don't and no one calls them on it, then it is our fault that uh, they were they're allowed to continue. Any uh, other you, yeah, well, you may have answered these, but Molly Solomon asked, what's your reasoning? And Charlotte Brandt, can you expand on that? I think I did. And you're always welcome to call me later, Charlotte. <laughs> um, the next slide uh, on full participation, and that's where this is where it gets a little bit gray. And this might be the justification for closing the primaries. Um, so in Article 8, it says, and this, this is in the charter, uh, it says the Democratic Party shall be open to all who desire to support the party and who wish to be known as Democrats. So this is in conflict with what it stated earlier about full participation or about you know opening up participation based on what states think are best. Um, and so, you know, who resolves ambiguities in the bylaws? Well, it's the body that resolves it. So uh, someone could, could ask for a ruling on whether uh, primaries could be open during presidential years. And if the chair rules that they can't, they can follow the process of appealing the ruling of the chair uh, and then the body voting on it. But it, it, it's the body, and in this case, it would be the Democratic National Committee members who would then vote on the interpretation of the, of the, uh, the rules. In the bylaws, so uh, the next slide is about how the bylaws are then chartered. So in the charter itself, it says that Bylaws of the Democratic Party shall be adopted to provide for the governance of the affairs of the Democratic Party in matters not provided for in this charter. 
and the bylaws may be adopted or amended by a majority vote of the national convention or the DNC with 30 days uh, written notice. Uh, and this one really caught my attention because what this means that is that there is no prior notice uh, specified for the national convention and that uh, the opportunity exists to change the bylaws at the convention itself. Now, the, if you think about back to the video clip that we showed about you know what the scene is actually like, it would take immense organization to pull this one off. It can't be you know one delegate walking up to a microphone surrounded by 2,700 delegates, you know, talking about where they're going to be cocktailing that night and trying to get a bylaws change. So we would have to be supremely organized to do this. Um, so that's at the convention. And then if we had uh, DNC members uh, who would represent our proposed bylaws changes, they could give 30 days notice to the rules committee of the DNC, and then these could be voted on at, at one of the quarterly meetings. Any questions on that? Well, I don't know specifically about that, but um, Molly Solomon asks, is getting bad press the only way to call attention to missteps and how can we vote them out? Um, Again, the you know, there's the regular cycle. So after 2020, Perez will have to run for reelection. Um, if he did a good job, uh, you know, he would deserve to be reelected. If he did a bad job, then uh, it's the responsibility of the of the DNC to elect a replacement, or he could be recalled. So I have not seen any language about recalling the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the chair. Uh, and since there is no language in the um, in the bylaws or the charter, then it would default to uh, whatever is in Robert Rules of Order. Um, okay. Uh Question from Oz Lefebvre, um, if the nomination goes to a second ballot and Perez deviates from the will of the people, what do you think will happen, if anything? I don't know how he could deviate, except, I mean, I, so if, if they have a first ballot and there's not a majority, then they would have to have a second ballot. And the rules have already been agreed upon that on the second ballot, all of the delegates released from whom they're committed to vote for and the superdelegates can vote. Uh, everyone understands those rules and that's what the expectation is. And so if he were to try to do something else, uh, I think, uh, again, a, a riot would break out at the convention. And, uh, you know, if it got too bad, they could end up with no nominee. Uh, like if enough people walked out and they lost a quorum. Yeah, but we so all, that would not be a good thing. We, we all know, right? Okay, but that's the we all know that's what's not likely to happen. If it goes to a second vote, then we uh, uh, we know that uh, the superdelegates are going to pick the establishment choice because we won't have all the superdelegates and it's over. I mean, that's that's really what's going to happen. <laughs> well, there's not that many superdelegates, so it you know it just depends on how the count goes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> depends on how uh, many they can purchase. <clears throat> Molly Solomon asks, so you can come in as an independent but leave as a Democrat. So I guess the illustration is what about a case like Sanders, who was an independent running for Senate and a Democrat running for president? I, uh, I have not checked his party registration, but I think I read that he registered as a Democrat. So if you remember last time, he was a registered Democrat running in the Democratic uh, primary, and then after the uh, after the the election was over, he he changed his party affiliation to independent. Also, remember he's he's continually been a member of the Democratic Caucus and a bunch of other Democratic committees and things. So it's not like he's not a Democrat. Just, and, he, and as the basic spiritual leader of the Democratic Party now, I mean he's he is the most Democrat of the Democrats. Yeah. Uh, um, e. Heller 42, and you may have answered this, Perez can't be trusted. What is the procedure for removing and replacing Perez? And when is the next opportunity? The next definite opportunity will be the first quarter after the presidential election. So somewhere between January and March of 2021, uh, Perez will be up for election. 
and I need to do more research on the recall process if it's not specified in the bylaws. Um, uh, Molly Solomon asks, I guess, a clarification about do all registered Democrats get a chance to vote? But we're talking about just the, the Democratic National Committee being able to vote for Perez or whoever is the chair, right? Yes, it's a it's a tiered process, just like it is in the Democratic Party of Oregon, where, uh, well, we have actually a multi-tiered situation here where Democrats in each precinct elect their precinct committee persons. The precinct committee persons elect their delegates to the state central committee, and the state central committee then elects the leadership of the Democratic Party of Oregon. Uh, similarly, uh, the delegates to the state central committee elect the delegates to the Democratic National Committee, and they elect the delegates to the, um, uh, to, and the, the delegates to the Na Democratic National Committee elect the leadership. So it does get way, way down uh, from the actual individual voter, but there is a, a line of people that are elected from the top to bottom. Uh, and so when you check off that, that vote, when you elect your precinct committee person who is your representative in the Democratic Party, that is you voting on who's going to represent you. And hopefully you had a choice um, and from, from, from which to choose, and you can pick the better of the two. And this is why it would be really great if more people knew about becoming precinct committee persons and got involved. So we had the best people possible making these decisions. And the Democratic Party is not run like a secret priesthood. Any other so, questions? Um <laughs> Yeah, I think Molly just wanted to clarify that you do then, uh, as just a de registered Democrat, you would go to the precinct delegate in your local precinct committee. Yes. yes. And if you if you saw if you saw the if you watched the, the videos of, of last Friday's candidate forum and you had a strong opinion about who you wanted to be see chair, you know, you should go to your county. You should track down your delegates to your uh to the state central committee from your county and have a conversation with them and let them know uh, because they are elected and they are accountable to you. They are supposed to be public servants just like every other elected official. Um, e Heller 42 is a, a difference. Of, what is the possibility of nullifying super delegates before the election? Uh, uh, so if, if you mean not giving super delegates a vote in the uh, well, it, it it it's not something that we can do because in the in these documents is where they are identified as DNC members. The reason why we call our three well our five uh, DNC members from Oregon super delegates is because they are unpledged. Uh, everyone else who goes to the convention from Oregon is pledged to a candidate, and that's who they have to vote for on the first ballot. And so what the change was that they made was that the superdelegates don't get to vote on the first ballot. So the unpledged delegates do not get to vote on the first ballot. And uh, and so someone had to have to go in and change that between now and the convention, which is, of course, a possibility. And uh, we could do it from the floor, uh, because the rules of the convention will be presented to the convention for adoption at the beginning. Um, uh, and I was going to talk a little bit about that later in the show. Any other questions? Uh, Very good. <laughs> let's, let's, let's move on anyway, and we'll take it on the next break. That was a lot of great questions, everybody. And yeah, really thank great. you. Uh, the next section is on the bylaws, which is a separate document. And like I said earlier, the bylaws in some places just reiterate what is in the charter. And so it makes the whole document a little bit confusing to read. And what they should really do is, is go in and clean them up so that they don't have one document restating the other. Because if they want to do something like change the number of delegates from you know a certain organization, they have to go in and change it from both. Um, but anyway... Uh, the Article 1 is where it says the National Convention is the highest authority of the Democratic Party subject to the provisions of the Charter. And the provisions of the Charter is what said that the Democratic Party 
needs to be open and the states get to choose who participates. And then it talks about what happens at the beginning of the convention. The National Convention shall adopt permanent rules governing the conduct of its business at the beginning of each convention. And until the adoption of the permanent rules, the convention and the activities shall be governed by temporary rules. So at the conventions, you know, it's, it's like this big party. <coughs> and this is the most boring thing that happens. And so if you wander onto the convention floor at the beginning, you, do, you, you can see that not everyone is there. But this is where all of the action has happens in terms of the rules. So this is where they bring the rules governing the convention to the body to be approved. And so the people who are on the floor and voting are the ones that get to approve it. And so if the rules were amended, this is where we would also uh, uh, stand up and move to amend uh, the, the, by the, the convention rules. Uh, they publish the convention rules in advance, so everyone gets to see what they are. Um, and there is a rules committee meeting prior to that, uh, where all the members of the rules committee can also uh, uh, field amendments. Um, so there's there's our opportunity to change things on the floor uh, if we are organized. Any questions on that piece? just sounds huge but when you say if we are organized so this is like we got to reach out to progressives in every state delegates in every state that's right we're talking like a national level kind of thing right yes uh there there was a the beginnings of that uh in 2016 uh of trying to organize the bernie delegates but you know if you remember that situation we knew going into the convention that that there was not a possibility of bernie attaining enough delegates to win and so it was a foregone conclusion that that Hillary was going to uh, to to win on the first vote. So um, we need a GoFundMe. <laughs> gonna, that's a great idea. We a should raise about uh, five million, and we need to get all of the progressive delegates who want the Democratic Party uh, to be more reflective of the will of the Democrats to get together and draft their amendments and uh, get them passed. Next slide, uh, DNC bylaws article two uh, says the Democratic National Committee shall have the general responsibility for the affairs of the Democratic Party between national conventions. So again, this reiterates what I was saying before where the DNC then runs the business of the party in between the conventions. But again, remember the, the, the amazing thing is that the convention is the, uh, the supreme authority in this whole thing. The next slide um, is about the DNC committees, and this is also an area that I was very interested in, because these are where, you know, the work is really done in the committees, and then the committees present their work to the, the, the assembly where it gets adopted or amended. So there's only four standing committees that are identified, the credentials, resolutions, rules and bylaws, and budget and finance. So of these, budget and finance, you know, that's all about money, and it's kind of a separate thing, and, uh, uh, you know, it's not really where the the action is, uh, other than the raising of the uh, all the bribes. <laughs> um, resolutions committee is where people can submit resolutions for the party to consider, just like we do at the state level and at the county level. Credentials uh, is, you know, a, a critical step in the process because that's how you determine who is eligible to vote on the floor. Uh, so. I've not seen this happen in the Democratic Party, but I've uh, one of our parliamentarians in Oregon is a member of the Libertarian Party, and he's been in situations where two delegations to the Libertarian Party would show up at their convention, both claiming to be legitimate. And so the Credentials Committee would have to uh, negotiate uh, you know, who gets seated. Now, the same thing happens at the state level. Um, you know, At this coming meeting, we have something like 17... Um, uh, caucuses and the caucuses were supposed to submit a report for them to be eligible to vote. Uh, I would suspect that that uh, that regardless of whether they submitted a report, they're all being credentialed, and those those delegates then could be challenged if someone wanted to do so. So credentials is fairly important, but then the most important is the rules and bylaws, and this is why seats on the rules and bylaws committee is so competitive, is because this is where you make the rules that, that get proposed to the body 
to, um, uh, to be adopted uh, and really where all the action happens. Uh, the Rules Committee shall receive and consider all the recommendations for adoption and amendments to the rules and the bylaws of the National Committee and the Charter of the Democratic Party. So if we had changes that we wanted to have considered at the next uh, quarterly meeting of the DNC, we would submit them to the Rules Committee and they would consider them and then they would, they would um, um, <clears throat> allegedly present them to the, um, to the, the body for approval. And because there is nothing else stated, the handling of these would be governed by what's in Robert's Rules of Order because that's the underlying uh, parliamentary authority. Committee membership. And this is where I was really, really interested in finding out how these things were uh, comprised. So uh, very broad powers given to the chair of the Democratic Party. Uh, members of all committees shall be appointed by the chairperson of the DNC in consultation with the executive committee subject to the ratification by the Democratic National Committee and shall be appointed to serve for the tenure of the chairperson. So people that get appointed at the beginning of a four-year term is for the four-year term of, of the chair. And if they get reelected uh, uh, to a subsequent four-year term, uh, then all of the existing committee members could continue on unless he decided to replace them. Uh, so what is really interesting about this is that there is wide discretion on who they choose and how many members belong to the rules committee. Um, typically in bylaws, you see, you know, some number like, like 15 or so uh, uh, slots to fill. Um, when I was on the rules committee for the convention, there were 169 members at, to the rules committee of the convention um, and they had a very elaborate system for voting, so that wasn't a complete nightmare. But you can imagine what it is like to be in a committee of 169 people. Uh, a lot of people there. Apparently, you we can contact the chair of the DNC and suggest people to be added because there is no upper limit uh, to the number of people that could get, get appointed to the rules committee. Any questions on, on that? Part Betsy. No. And then section eleven is where it reiterates what was also in the charter: uh, the Democratic Party shall be open to all who desire to support the party and who wish to be known as Democrats. Uh, <coughs> participation in the affairs of the Democratic Party shall be open pursuant to the standards of non-discrimination and affirmative action incorporated into the charter of the Democratic Party. This is as specific as I could find that would uh, be language that could be used to justify closing the primaries um, during the presidential year. Um, so what we need to do then is have a conversation with the DNC to see if there is some other document that someone thinks that governs this. But from, from what I could find in and especially what is in the charter, which is the document that creates the Democratic Party of the United States of America, uh, states can determine whether or not uh, the primaries can be open. Final slide on this, what can we do? Uh, again, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. We need to examine the charter and the bylaws and see whether there are changes in order to restore power to the rank and file Democrats. Um, you know, what we should do is get together and talk about what we find, what we think are issues in the Democratic Party and the way that's run, and what changes should be proposed to the documents that would address those deficiencies, and then start the process of getting them adopted. And then we need to decide how to adopt the changes, um, which could require working together in all 50 states. And we have time. <laughs> There's time between now and, uh, and the convention in 2020 to, to weigh in. So if anyone is watching from other states who would like to get this started, there is, um, there is already a, uh, an affiliation of, of delegates from 2016, um, uh, which we hope many of them are, will be returning to the convention in 2020. Uh, and that would be the, the start. Uh, we really need to 
form it into a more solid organization so that we have leadership and we have organized meetings. And as John suggested, we start a GoFundMe operation so we could raise the, the couple of million bucks that we need to make this happen. I have posted both the bylaws and the charter document and the delegate selection rules to advancementofdemocracy.org. Um, if you have any interest in this, uh, you can go out and start reading them on your own. And if you have ideas on what could be changed, we would love to have them uh, sent to us um, so we can start compiling a list of things that we can consider. And you know, <clears throat> whatever we need to do to start this national organization to, uh, to, to act basically as a progressive caucus within the Democratic Party of the United States of America. Any final questions? Well, Pete Lee uh, asked, wanted to know whether the Rules Committee used those remote clickers for voting like they did on the platform. And uh, Pete Lee is running for vice chair of the Democratic Party of Oregon, right? Yes, he is. Uh, So the voting I saw in the rules committee, um, and I, I, I assume that's what Pete's talking about. Uh, yeah, they used, they, everyone had their uh, registered voting uh, uh, tool uh, that when, you know, they could vote yes or no on things. And then all 169 members of the rules committee were displayed on a screen with their names. So everyone could see how everyone voted. It was, it was very cool. But if you're talking about voting on the convention floor, uh, again, uh, following Robert, Robert Schultz's order, the first vote would be a voice vote. And uh, hopefully it won't be like the Nevada convention. And you can, you can clearly hear um, who's on the, the prevailing side of the vote. Um, if, uh, if, uh, if it's not clear and it's ambiguous, then you follow standard processes for counting votes. Um, Pete Lee is asked, Larry, would you mind speaking to the pro and con of open primaries? I've heard rural for folks say, hey, I don't think you want my NAV voters um, <laughs> voting. They are really conservative. Uh, I don't think, I, I think, you know, we not a lot of study has been done about the characteristics of non-affiliated voters. Uh, what we do know is that there's a lot of them that have never been reached out to because they were automatically registered. There's a number of people who are disgusted with politics and don't want to have anything to do with any of the political parties. And so hell would freeze before they would join one. Um, uh, you know, my gut feel is that there's like a quarter of them that are progressive. There's a quarter of them that are conservative. There's probably a quarter that are in the middle and there's about a quarter that uh, would never vote if they're, even if their lives depended upon it. But that's just my gut feel of what's out there. And I'm sure it does vary from where you are in the state. Uh, but, you know, some of our most ardent progressives are, are in the hinterlands of Oregon. You know, the, 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 the chairs of Wallowa County were, were, were strong burner advocates. And, you know, Wallowa County is as far as you can get uh, when, it, when you get into rural Oregon. Um, same as in Lake County and Klamath County, um, you can't, you know, the numbers are different, but the progressives are out there. Um, he also says he's not nuts about open primaries and prefers same day voter registration. And what are your thoughts? Uh, I don't know. I, I, we, we have to have a debate about this and I don't think we've really had one, uh, the numbers also change uh, daily. So in the last two years, we've had literally thousands and thousands and thousands of additional non-affiliated voters uh, where the, the vote count within the Democratic Party has hardly changed at all. Uh, it is not healthy in a democracy to have people who don't vote. Uh, you know, ideally, we would have a robust system where we go out and we, in each county, we talk to non-affiliated voters and we tell them about the, the platform of the Democratic Party and, and explain to them that, you know, if these are your beliefs and you would like to help push them, 
then we need you to be a, a Democrat. And all you need to do is fill out this form or go to this website and join join the party. Um, you know, as a party, we have to conduct ourselves with integrity. We have to follow the rules and we can't break the rules every time we don't like the results because that's why people distrust parties. So we have to have several years of, of behaving ethically uh, and honorably so that people uh, will then have trust in the party itself. Um, but with, you know, everyone, we really need everyone to get involved with voting. Having a 34% turnout rate is not healthy for the democracy because those are people, the, the majority of people are opting out of our democracy, which is not good. John, you're going to say something? Yeah, I just want to say, why not both? I mean, same day voter registration, because we should all be able to vote and not have it be a pain in the ass. It should just be a, a right. It should happen at birth. Uh, you know, it should be a problem for anybody. And the idea that uh, that open registration or open vo voting primaries is going to destroy uh, uh, the, the, the Democratic vote is kind of messed up. I mean, it's it, 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 it's I think it's a false concept. I don't think that happens. It's like the idea of, of, uh, of voter fraud, right? It's not really happening, but everybody wants to talk about it. So it, it, it's, I'm really not, I don't get the fears of how that's going to, how these Republican voters are going to skew the, the vote that much, right? That's a lot of effort to go through. So uh, that's just my thought on it. Why not both? Yeah, you're talking about people who hate the Democratic Party voting in the Democratic Party. And they, you know, I think, People generally have enough integrity not to do. Well, that. that's an extreme fringe. You know, it's it's if, yeah. if it exists, it's got to be an extreme fringe group. I mean, and and if it weren't, then it would be so blatantly obvious that I would think we would be able to stop it. That's the other thing, you know. But that 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 means we have to have integral elections. It kind of that's the whole problem to begin with, right? We don't. Our elections don't exactly have a, a good baseline for integrity. Well, and it, it may also be part of the system of primaries altogether. You know, that primaries are just about two dominant parties usually. And every other party selects their um, nominee for the general election in a convention. So, you know, star voting or ranked choice voting may be the alternative to having primaries yeah. and worrying about this issue at all. I, yeah. You know, it's your fundamental issue about how we vote, period, how we choose candidates. I, I, yeah, absolutely right. And something else that I'm surprised Dennis hasn't brought up, and I don't know if he has, is the idea that we have these things that take forever. Uh, the, the entire election cycle in Germany is six weeks. That's it. Could you imagine if we cut it down to that? It would completely change the game. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. And, you know, all we need is, is uh, for the technology to get to the point where we could trust the system because... We shouldn't have to be electing people to elect people to elect people. We should be able to get to a more direct form of democracy. Ah, the RIC, right? The referendum yeah. initiated by the citizen, the yellow vest. That's exactly what they're about. A national popular or a national referendum. The states have this, but we don't use it. Right. But then we could affect direct democracy. That's another discussion. <laughs> Oh, please email me if you want to get on the national conversation of what we can do to clean up our existing mess.